All right. So Colossians 4, we're picking up from Colossians 3, a couple verses back, where verse 22 says, Bond servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. So you remember from this last chapter, there were a list of instructions. There were instructions for husbands and then for wives and then for children and masters and so on. And when we think in terms of this topic of masters, we could say, well, we don't really have slavery today. But if you think in terms of who you work for, that you're not giving eye service to your um, employer, that you're not giving eye service to the, the person that's managing you, but that you're serving as unto the Lord. And then notice it says in verse 23, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And that's, see, that's what it really comes down to. Sincerity of heart, fearing God to do things heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And that really puts things into perspective. Again, we can uh, circle back around to last week's message if we want a little bit more about this idea. The point is, is that this is important that we touch on this because the very first verse goes into not just what they're talking about with bond servants, but with masters. So let's go back to verse 25 of the previous chapter, though. It says, and he who does wrong will be repaid for it, uh, for what he has done, and there's no partiality. So it's talking again about bond servants, their conduct, and how they should serve, and so on, and that they're serving as unto the Lord. And then we pick up here in verse 1, where Paul writes, Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And there's this idea, it's reciprocated, where the bond servant is supposed to serve the person in who they're employed by or enslaved to are supposed to serve as unto the Lord. And Paul himself calls himself a bond servant of Christ. He willingly, and you could argue that that's his position anyway, that's our position, that we're all enslaved to Jesus, but it really is something that's elective. The bond servant in the Old Testament is somebody that sees that his master is good, comes to him and says, I want to live with you and to be under your care for the rest of my life. And here we see what the response is to that master. It says, masters, give your bond servants what's just and fair. Now, I believe Paul's saying that because there are masters that don't give what's just and fair. That there are masters who are looking for the opportunity to just get the, the least pay, but the most work out of somebody that they can get. And in fact, that's something that's come into our culture today. Of course, it's in our culture, but the idea of the wrongness of it has really been expanded and... Now we have people that are completely against capitalism and business owners and everything because they just believe that business owners and capitalists and mindset are just looking out for themselves in order to, you know, stick it to the worker and for them to get rich. And absolutely there are examples of that. But absolutely there are examples of those masters, those people who are business owners. And I would tend to say that they're actually in the majority that are good, that are just, and that they're fair. And even on top of that, there are some that are believers, that serve the Lord and are just and fair, and they know also that they have a master in heaven, like it says here in verse 1. That they are an underservant or under shepherd of the Lord himself. And so they're very concerned about these things and the people that are working for them. And so Paul, though, is saying this is what the deal is, that with regard to your bond servants, you need to do what's just and fair with them as though or from the same idea that you would want to be treated by the Lord, that that's how you should treat those people that work for you. And we see this example, Jesus speaks of it, where in Luke chapter 6, he says, give and it will be given to you. This is a, 
a familiar verse to us, but he says, given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. It's this idea that, that the way that we conduct ourselves in giving, honesty, fairness, attitude, response, that we would want to have the same kind of response from God. And so if God is tight, you know, if we're tight-fisted and harsh and unfair, then it's, is that what we would want from the Lord? If this is how we're conducting ourselves, and Jesus seems to make this correlation that the manner in which we conduct ourselves would be the manner in which God will relate to us. If we're aloof, if we're disconnected, then the Lord could show that to us. Now, thankfully, the Lord is gracious, and even when we've sinned in that, that's washed and covered over. But we need to remember that that's washed and covered over and, and stay at the cross with regard to that, because if we're trying to, if we're not mindful of Jesus, and if we still have all of this associated with us, if this is still how we conduct ourselves, then knowing that you also have a master in heaven to give what's just and fair, how would we want to, to be if we're unjust and unfair to the people that we relate to, then is that how we want to come before the Lord and be dealt with and then suffer the consequence for any, for an eternal, uh, stretch it's it's horrible so verse two continues though and that's that's sort of the summation now why the chapter break is there i don't know it seems like you could have gone a little further and just started with verse two because verse one seems to have more to do with the previous chapter so now we're transitioning a little bit and then paul begins and he says continue earnestly in prayer being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. So I believe that the writers, I'm sorry, the editors in the sense of the chapter edits were thinking that the masters and those who are related there are supposed to be in prayer. And I would, wouldn't disagree with that. And that might be why they connected this first verse instead of having it be in the previous that they connected it here that if we're in any position of authority, if you're a parent, if you've got a paper route, if no one has paper routes anymore today, right? Um, now it's just email routes. Um, but if you have even a, a lawn care business to running uh, you know, a, a multi-million dollar organization or anywhere in between, if you have people that report to you that it's important that you do what's just and fair knowing that you have a master in heaven and that you continue earnestly in prayer, that you continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, because there can be a breakdown that we can have even as family members, as, as parents, that if we're not engaged in prayer with respect to our family, then, then there's a strong likelihood we can be unjust and unfair with the people in our family. Because that's where you get your compass from. That's where you, you get your, your direction. That's where God speaks to you and he says, maybe you need to get back into the word. And he speaks to you directly and he speaks to you through his word. And you get that instruction and you realize, wow, maybe previous verses, I'm provoking my children to wrath. Maybe I'm being unkind to my wife. Maybe there's things that are not right in my relationships. And then likewise, maybe I'm being unjust with people. So, I can understand it being there, but notice what it says as a standalone, verse two and three, it says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. So continue, first of all, just continue. Do you pray? Yeah, I prayed once. Well, we're supposed to continue, to have a continuation of prayer. And it's like a conversation that you would have with somebody that's a friend. We may come back together here on a weekly basis, but we have an ongoing conversation with one another where we see 
one another. And hopefully with our spouses, we have a closer, it's not just once a week that we have this conversation. And with our children and with the people we work with, how much time do we spend with them? So we have this conversation. And to think of those conversations now, think of that in light of our relationship with the Lord. To have a continued conversation, a continued relationship. But notice it says continue earnestly in prayer. Continue earnestly. That means seriously and intently. There's an earnestness. There's a seriousness. There's an intent that when we're praying, we're respect, we're anticipating a response. Much like if I was to say something to any of you, if I was to say, hi, good morning, how are you today? Or almost good afternoon. That I would anticipate a response. That the Lord doesn't just say, he doesn't just forget about us, but that he responds and that we have a seriousness and an anticipation and an intention, we, an intent that we know he's going to respond to us. That sort of expectation. And to continue in that, to continue with this mindset and this attitude of prayer. Then notice it says being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. So the idea of being vigilant is to be watchful, of course. It's to be attentive. I was reminded of James chapter 1 with respect to being vigilant. James 1 verse 6 says, But let him who asks, ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his, all his ways. So the specific context is asking for wisdom, seeking the Lord for wisdom. But let's just say in for prayer in general, which a lot of our prayers are about wisdom. Lord, give me wisdom on how to deal with this situation. I've got um, bills that are due and I don't have enough money. I've got uh, situations like what's going on with Marissa. Lord, we this isn't even something we can... If we had millions of dollars, it's like, I don't know. This is something that money can't handle, but we know you can. So give us wisdom. Give the doctors wisdom. Give the nurses, all of the staff wisdom. What are we going to do? We've got uh, summers wrapping up, and we have this, this virus thing that's still going on, and, and so schools may not be open. I need wisdom on what's going to happen there. I need wisdom with regard to my job. I don't even know if I'll, I'll have a job that I can return to. Some people are still waiting to get back to work because they've been furloughed. And so you're seeking the Lord. And yet, James says, let him ask in faith with no doubting. And so this is the idea of continuing earnestly in prayer, being vigilant, that you're asking with faith, with an anticipation, with a watchfulness, with attentiveness. A lot of people, they'll ask God for things, they'll pray, and then they'll just not be attentive. It's just like they lose sight of it. And so the Lord is trying to communicate back. The Lord is trying to speak to their heart, but then they don't know if what they're thinking about that's in their heart is legit or not because they don't have a foundation of God's word to test it against, and they're not in God's word at all. They're not reading in the Bible. I don't say that as a rule. I say that as, as a means to understand and discern what the Spirit is leading in. We were talking earlier about the idea that, you know, where two or three are gathered in my name, that, that that's <laughs> the idea of two in the Bible is used as a witness. It's the, it's the secondary confirmation. And there can be a third confirmation as well, but it's the idea that we hear, we receive some direction from God, and we need something to confirm it so that we know that it's, it's God. We know that it's, it's Him. Sometimes we just know because we have this storehouse of, of um, promises and verses that we know it's consistent with. So it would be like, should I be, should I give a blessing or should I be kind to somebody? Okay, well, we've got scripture verses that can affirm that, no problem. 
But then there are other times that they come up and we're just not really sure. And, and so we just sort of take a guess at whether this is from the Lord or not. We say, well, if the door's open, it must be the Lord. And there is a door that opens, but usually the door that opens has to do with missions. It isn't just like, okay, well, if the door opens, if I can, you know, I, I really want a boat. And if the door opens, if I can get financing, then, then it must be from the Lord. Without thinking about those other verses that talk about, oh, nothing to no man and, and that we're enslaved by debt and things like that. So we don't think about that stuff. So the point is, is that when we seek the Lord, we're earnest in prayer, we're vigilant, we're anticipating him, and that we're not doubtful, but that we're, we're anticipating his reply. And then notice it says, with thanksgiving, and it says, um, with thanksgiving specifically, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. So these days, when you enter into a building for a lot of the places that you work, you have an access card, right? Anyone know what I'm talking about? Some sort of access card where maybe you don't, but you know somebody that does. So if you go to a gym, let's say, and you're working out, they might have an access card. So Ted uh, has an access card for, I think it's Anytime Fitness. Just uses it, boom, and then he can get on in. The thing that's interesting about that is that that correlates back over to this idea of being earnest, in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. That thanksgiving is like the access card that starts everything going with regard to prayer. And we learn that through like Psalm 100, where it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter into his courts with praise, be thankful to him and bless his name. That we begin prayer, it's almost like the access point. And it isn't just the lip service of, okay, I give you thanks, Lord, but it's the attitude that when we enter into prayer and we're seeking a situation, supplications, prayers, these matters, that we're going, starting with the access card to, to sort of get in, because it's an attitude. It's not like we need to get into heaven or into that throne room of grace. We're already invited there. But the, the thanksgiving is what gives us that access that attitude to receive anything that the Lord wants to do, to be submitted to him and to say, God, I'm just so thankful to be here. I, I had all these prayer requests, but that's all. It's not an important, but man, the thing that's important is who you are and giving you praise for who you are to bless your name. And the idea of blessing is to give favor or to acknowledge favor for him to say, you know what, God, you're my favorite. You're my favoriteest person in the whole wide world. There's nothing that compares with you. And so with that, that's our access card coming in. And then we come with our prayers and it's all within the context of saying, all right, so these are the things that are going on in my life. And I'm not going to doubt that you're working, but I do understand that you may be working differently than I may be thinking. So I'm just going to start with praise and give you thanks for who you are. And as you unfold these matters before me, then I'm just going to trust you and I'm going to be earnest and I'm going to be expectant and I'm going to be serious about it. And I'm going to be vigilant and watchful that you're going to have an answer, but it all starts with Thanksgiving. If you're not thankful, then a lot of times the prayers, you don't even you don't even understand what the reply is because God's trying to give it. and We're just bitter. We're upset. We're angry. God, you better do this because you haven't done it and I'm really getting mad. Now, God's patient with an attitude like that. But when we enter in with thanksgiving, then we're receptive. We're receptive. So let's move on. We have a lot to cover, but so meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains. So praying also for us. In other words, this is Paul's way of saying, hey, you know, here's a prayer request. Pray for us. That, and this is what I made reference to earlier, that God would open to us a door for the word. So 
a lot of people just say, oh, we want God to open a door for, you know, this thing to happen. You know, contextually, what we see is God opening a door for ministry, for the word of God to be delivered. A door. So behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would come and open the door, I'll come in and, and sup with them. That's the type of door we're talking about. We're not talking about doors for new cars and, and boats and houses and wives and or husbands or new wives and new husbands and all this other stuff. That is not the door we're talking about. We're talking about a doorway to bring God's word. And this is what Paul's praying for. That God would open to us a door for the word to, to do what? To speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains. To speak the mysteries of Christ. So what is the mystery of Christ? We saw that back in chapter 1, verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery of Christ is that Gentiles could be saved, that it didn't have to come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and specifically, you didn't have to be of the tribe of Jacob or Israel, that you could be saved without being circumcised, in a sense. But then what do we learn from Paul? He says, no, you still need to be circumcised, but that circumcision, whether it's the Jew who's already physically circumcised or the Gentile who's not circumcised, it's the circumcision of the heart, the removal of the flesh, carrying, carrying on after the ways of the flesh instead of the ways of the Spirit. So that's the mystery here. And I know we've touched on this a lot, especially when we went through Galatians and a little bit in Ephesians and then here in, in Colossians. It's this idea that there's a mystery, and, and this is something that people knew of it in the Old Testament, but... It, it was kind of mysterious. Now it's been disclosed that whosoever would believe wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever. So, awesome news. And then, not only praying for us that this door would be open for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I'm also in chains, verse 4, that I may make manifest as I ought to speak. So his goal is, Lord, first of all, pray for us. So that's how we're praying for Paul. And what is it? That the door would be open for the word. So that's great. And that his, the word that would go forth is to share the mystery of God. The gospel is available to all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, so that's awesome. That's awesome. But then Paul goes on in verse 4 and he says, That I may make it manifest. That I might make it apparent that I might make, make it visible, that, that we're praying that Paul would be able to do this, or at least the Colossians and the Laodiceans and those from Hierapolis, are, he's requesting prayer, that the door's open, that he can speak it, that he understands it, but it's a work of the Spirit, but that he wants to make it manifest. And this is awesome. When we're sharing with our kids the gospel, when we're sharing <coughs> with our kids anything, just because we have the head knowledge doesn't mean that the door is open. So we need to look for that opportunity that the door would be open in their hearts to receive. And then as the door is open, that we would be able to make it manifest, that we would be able to make it clear, make it apparent, make it simple to understand, to make it something that you could receive. So, pretty awesome. And notice how he says, as I ought to speak. In other words, this is what Paul was created to do. And I thought about this. I thought, so Paul says, this is what I need. I need you guys to pray for me, that the door would be open, a door would be open for God's word, and that as I give the word, it would be the mysteries of God, that I wouldn't get it caught up in, in other things, and that I would be able to make it apparent and visible. And then he says, as I ought to speak. This is what Paul was created to do. This is what he should do. So if you have, if I've got a bottle here, 
I, there's a reason this was created for a purpose, and this purpose is very clear. It's been filled with water, and its purpose is to be filled with water, to be ready to be consumed as the owner wants to consume it and to provide water accordingly. And then afterward, its purpose is done. Now, you could use it for a lot of different purposes. You could try to hammer a nail in with it. You could throw it at someone. I'm not throwing it, sorry. You could throw it at someone, but it has a specific purpose. And the fact is, is that Paul is saying, this is what I do. I preach the gospel. I'm waiting for a door to be open. I to give forth the mystery of Christ and to make that manifest, to make it apparent as I ought to do. What is your purpose? For what reason have you been created? Why are you breathing, drawing in air and exhausting air or exhaling it? Why are we alive? What, what are we doing here? And the fact is, is that it's important for us to be faithful to what we have been created for, because as Paul says, as I ought to do, that he'll be able to say before God, I did what I was supposed to do. You made me this way. I did what I was created to do. Now, the fact is, is that all of us have similar purposes, I believe. Because we all have ears, we all have noses and mouths and hands. We all have and eyes, we have the same senses and we have the same ability to communicate. And likewise, we're told to go out into all the world and to make disciples. So in a general sense, we could say, you know what, I've been, I have a calling that's similar to Paul's. Now, Paul was called to be an apostle. We may have been called to be a pastor or a teacher or an evangelist or a prophet. But whatever you are created to be, you need to do it as you ought to. That's what it comes down to. And to really consider that, lots of times, no, I don't care. I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter what I've been created for. I don't think I've been created for anything. I'm just going through life. This is it. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's an account that we'll be all held all be held to before the Lord as we ought. And there are lots of things that we ought to do and that we might be missing. And we need to get that right with the Lord if we're missing what we were supposed to have done. What should you have done? So, verse 5. And believe it or not, this is kind of the summation from verse 5 through verse 18, where he says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. So those who are outside, those are unbelievers, those who are outside of the church. Walk in wisdom toward them. Again, well, Lord, I need wisdom. Well, if you're going to ask for wisdom, ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. So we have a lot of interactions with people who are outside of the church. And the way that we're supposed to conduct ourselves with them is with wisdom. With wisdom. And we can say, boy, I never even thought about that. What's wisdom? Well, you can ask the Lord. God, I don't even know what wisdom is. But I know that the beginning of it is the fear of God. So I'll start there by fearing you. And then from there, if I'm going to conduct myself with wisdom, then I'm going to tr or attempt to, then I'm going to seek you, Lord, for your direction so that you can bring me the wisdom that I need because I'm going to talk to people who are outside, could be managers, bosses, whatever, neighbors across the street, and that you need to have a wise answer for them. And you can think, I'm not very wise. How do I have a wise answer? Well, Ask, let him ask in faith with no doubting. And don't suppose that you'll receive anything if you're doubting. If you're saying, God, I need wisdom, but I'm just too stupid to have wisdom. Well, if you're not going to receive it. But if you ask him and you say, God, I'm going to trust you because I really know that I lack wisdom, but I'm going to trust that you'll bring it. And that as you bring it, I'm going to step out in it and give it away. So, awesome. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. 
redeeming the time. So if you were to redeem something, that's to you know save it or cash it in. So this is where we take something. This is kind of neat because in the economy of God, we have a limited amount of time that's given to us. And we can use the gospel of God and to give forth that gospel, to give forth the wisdom that he gives to us, and to take that time and for that to be turned into, I guess you could say, gold, silver, and precious stones in God's sight. So let's say, like right now, we spend time on a, on a weekly basis for an hour with one another, sharing the gospel, encouraging each other, edifying one another, like what we see a couple uh, weeks ago, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, encouraging, edifying, building up each other. We spend this time. Time is something that comes and then it goes and from God's standpoint, it's eternal, so you could say that it's not really worth much. But if we are investing our time toward the service of other people, that cha- transfers time, that redeems the time into ministry that is in turn granted to us as spiritual blessings. Gold, silver, precious stones, which we in turn use as a it's a crown that's that's made, and then we in turn use that to worship the Lord for all eternity. And it's a mystery how it works. Zach was asking me, he was saying, so how is it that the sun hits the solar panel, and then now we have electricity? How is it that the sun energy is transferred into electric power? Now, we can look at that from a scientific standpoint. Clearly, we have, and it works, and we do that. But the point is, is that for many of us, it's a mystery. How does that transfer something that just seems limitless, that really, I mean, the sun is out. It's it's just going by. We're not thinking about it. It's just burning, and it's got energy that's coming down here. But then for that period of time, if you've got a little solar light or solar panels or whatever it is, it's able to convert and you're able to get some usefulness. And it's as though you take something that is just so expansive and you're able to take a piece of it and minister it and it ends up coming to your credit. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty cool. And the same thing is true here where when we're engaged in in this, where we're redeeming the time, We're cashing in time for articles of worship to God, for Jesus, for all eternity. Something that just seems, man, time, it's just, for us it's limited, but for God it's like the sun. It's just, as far as I know, it's just going to be an eternal thing. But then we harness it, and it's an awesome thing. And then it ministers, and so... Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So this is right in line. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Well, how do you do that? Well, let your speech always be with grace. In other words, speaking of God's favor, your favor toward God, and God's favor toward people. That it's just like we're, our message isn't, ah, God hates you and you're going to go to hell. But our message is, God loves you, and there's an issue of sin that needs to be reconciled, but he even took care of that. All you need to do is just receive his favor, his gift, his grace, and not push that away anymore. And it's an awesome thing. So we let our speech always be with grace, and then notice it says seasoned with salt. Now, there's a lot of different ideas that people have come up with this, but the one that I think of, when I think of something that's seasoned with salt, we hear about, well, it's preserving and, you know, all of these things. But let's just come down to it. We were talking about shish kebabs a little bit ago. You know, and we just came off of the 4th of July. And many of you were, were grilling and, you know, had a lot going on along this line. And you may have put some salt and some pepper on this because what does it do? It, it draws out the flavor of what you're cooking. 
and see, this is what's really cool because this is where God has a message. God has a very simple message that relates to his grace and his favor for people and that we're involved in seasoning it up. We're not changing it, but we're talking to the person and we find out, you know, this is somebody that they can't handle too much seasoning, so I need to be careful there, but I, I don't need to present it in a way that's bland. <laughs> but I need to add a little bit of salt so that it's something that's like, wow, this kind of tastes good. This is something I'm interested in. This is, can I have seconds? <laughs> can I have more of this, right? If it's something that's really good, you're thinking this is something that I want more of. And this is, this is where the Lord works in the wisdom of our personalities and things like that to sort of season things. And, and it's like, I don't know what each person needs. Someone might not need that much salt. Some may need a lot more. And yes, that's where the wisdom comes in. And the Lord speaks to us and he says, well, maybe you just throw in a little illustration here. Maybe you talk to them about something that's relevant to them there. You know, you, you may have a great illustration that's a, that relates to a dog or something, but they're cat people. It's not going to work, right? Or vice versa. It's just God will give you the wisdom, but here it is. It comes down to this. Very simply, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Everybody's different in the respect that they have different spiritual taste buds, the things that just like, hey, this is really good. I'm not talking about different religions and weird stuff like that. I'm not talking about, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, all right, through Jesus. There's only one way to be saved. There's only one way to the Father. But there may be different things that appeal to other people that, that just works for them. You may like potato chips. Someone else may like, what were those things we had? Plantains. Okay, so that's, those are like banana chips, plantain chips. And then when my oldest son was in Korea, he said, yeah, the, the little kids, they just, they kind of have chips that they bring with them, but they're usually little salted squid or fish so you know we're we're popping back potato chips some health food person is eating plantain chips and other people are eating squid chips the point is is that it's a little bit different for each person as far as what appeals to them and it's up to us to say god open the door show me the way i pray for god to you know work in this way and pray for me Pray for you, praying for one another that this would be at work, that we could impart grace, that we could share grace, that we can season it in such a way that it would minister, that it would just kind of touch their perspective, touch their attitude, touch their heart, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. How am I going to know? How are you going to know? Only by praying with earnestness and with expectation and with thanksgiving. Then we have the names of the guys who joined Paul in the ministry. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, fellow servant of the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. So uh, Tychicus, his name is interesting. It means fortunate. So this would be the guy in church that has the nickname, hey, lucky, hey, lucky. You know, in church, this is the guy. This is him. So Tychicus, what's he going to do? He's going to tell what's been going on with Paul. He's a faithful minister, a beloved brother. You know, sometimes you just don't get the name that, you know, might give the best impression. But it's the name you got. You may be named Lucky. You may be Rocky. Or you might be something else. But it doesn't matter. The issue comes down to, are you a beloved brother or sister, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord? Literally, that word servant there means deacon, diakonos, which is kind of interesting. This would be like deacon lucky, <laughs> deacon fortunate. It doesn't work. It's like Pastor Rocky, right? 
when people see that and they go, I don't know about that guy. So I'm sending him to you for this very purpose that he may know your circumstances and comfort your heart. So he's going to share what's been going on with Paul. But when he gets there, he's not going to just say, okay, here's the news report. This is what's going on with Paul. I'm out of here. But he goes and he's going to show up and then he wants to know their circumstances. And then he's going to comfort their hearts. He's going to encourage them. And then he's going to come with Onesimus, verse 9, a fellow and beloved brother who is one of you. In other words, he's from Colossae. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. So Onesimus, he was the guy who Paul wrote the letter to Philemon, who was the slave owner. Onesimus bailed. He was a runaway slave from Colossae. And so he now he's following, he's since got saved, and he's following Paul. And Paul writes back to him and says, well, here's the deal, Philemon. Onesimus, your fellow slave, or fellow, your former slave, or your current slave, however you want to look at it, but he's with me now, and he's really useful in the work of the ministry. He's useful to me. To me. And he writes this letter to say, basically, can I use him? Can I use him in the ministry? He's giving that, he's asking for that permission here. Because Paul's not a disrespectful person. You know, I'm just going to say this in passing, and I'll try to make it very quick, but there are churches that will start churches literally right next door to each other. Some of them are in the same denomination. Some of them could be Calvary chapels. And the new pastor comes in there and just says, you know what, I'm here, and God led me here, so I don't really care whether that infringes upon you or not, because God led me. I'm hearing from the Lord. And the fact is, is that sort of stuff happens, and it violates the bigger issue of serving one another or being respectful to other things and other people who are around you. Paul's got this slave who's really helpful to him. God's using him. But he goes back to Philemon and says, look, I want us to be right. And if I'll pay for him to be released as a slave. But I don't want this to be a wrong thing. And it's really sad when these types of things come in where people are just headstrong to think, hey, God led me. You can do a lot of manipulation, which is exactly what it is. You can do a lot of manipulation that way. You could just, you know, I as a pastor, if I was a bad pastor, hopefully I'm not, but I could just say, well, God told me, and then to control and to manipulate individual lives, individual people within the church. It's really sad. God told me. God told me. Well, I'll be the first one to say that God didn't tell you that. Because it's harmful to your brother. It's not sensitive or it's not wrong wrong word it's disrespectful to your neighbor you wouldn't want somebody else to do that to you why would you do that to them why don't you love them why are you being hurtful and again these types of things come up within the church not just talking about churches but even within a family where someone just wants their will so well i don't care god told me how do you do how do you deal with that god told you so sometimes God did tell them, and then he'll bring that witness or that confirmation to the other person, then you can move forward. But if there's an impasse, you should not move forward. You should stop right there until it's resolved. So, all right, more to talk about with that another time. Maybe that's more of a counseling thing, but Onesimus, here he is. He's one of them. Make known to you all things that are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. So Aristarchus here, um, he's also, he's a Macedonian. So uh, Macedonia would be, well, it's where Macedonia is now, if you know the <laughs> geography. Guess what? Hey, the, Rock, he was, he had a brilliant one today. He told us that Macedonia in the Old Testament, or in the you know, in the Bible is the same Macedonia as today. It is, all right. So the point is, is that's where Aristarchus is from. And notice he, a fellow prisoner. So that's telling us that Aristarchus is in jail with Paul. 
he's there. Don't know what he did, but just being around Paul, he got himself thrown into jail. And then notice, with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Well, wait a second. You remember Barnabas and Paul had sort of a falling out because of Mark. First missionary journey went, Mark was in it, and then he bailed out midway. Maybe he was overwhelmed with the requirements of ministry. Maybe, you know, he was disillusioned as far as what ministry was. So he bailed. Second missionary journey comes up. Paul and Barnabas are talking about leaving. Barnabas says, hey, let's go ahead and get, get Mark. Let's try him out again. And Paul's like, no, this is serious business. This is the ministry of God. And so they got into it. Barnabas, son of encouragement, says, come on, let's bring John Mark. Let's bring my nephew. He's okay. He made a mistake. He's all right. Paul wouldn't have it. Had a sharp division. That was the beginning of a missionary team splitting and going in different directions. We don't hear about Barnabas anymore, really. But we do kind of because now we find out that John Mark is back in the ministry. And he's serving Paul. And, he's, and, and Paul is saying, look, with respect to John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, whom you received, if he comes, welcome him. And Jesus called justice. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They've proved to be a comfort to me. So these are all who have been circumcised. More specifically, you could say that they were all Hebrews, even people from Macedonia and all these other places that there were Jews there. And then Epaphras, who is one of you, another person from Colossae, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So Epaphras, he was the reason why Colossae and Laodicea and Hierapolis had churches there. It's because Epaphras got saved back in Ephesus, and then he went home, and then he shared the gospel. It's just like we could call that remarkable, or we could say, no, isn't that what you're supposed to do? You got saved, and then you go home and share the gospel. Wherever you're at, you go home, share the gospel. You got saved, this is what happens. So notice what's up with Epaphras, though, who's one of you. He's a bondservant of Christ. He greets you, and he's always laboring fervently for them in prayers. This means that when they have their prayer meeting together, you know, sometimes we have the things that we regularly pray for. Epaphras was praying for the work there in Laodicea and Colossae, specifically Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. He was always, and it says, laboring fervently for you in prayers. I think of a woman who's in labor. There's nothing casual about that. There's a fervency. It's serious business. No goofing around. No messing around here. It's on point. What's he pray for? That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Perfect and complete. That's awesome. Man, I want to talk about that more, but we're running out of time. But that you may stand, first of all, as opposed to not being able to stand. And that you stand how? Perfect. Perfect. That we're perfect in Christ. This is how he's praying for them. Let the Colossian church be able to stand up, and to understand that they're perfect in Christ, they're born again, that if you know all their sin is atoned for once and for all, it is finished, it's done. And then it, notice, and complete, complete in Christ, that they have every spiritual blessing at their disposal. They have everything that they need for life and godliness. They're complete. They're not lacking in anything. This is what he's praying for them. And then it goes on in all the will of God. In other words, you know, sometimes we can say, well, you know, in my Christian walk, I've kind of caught the will of God in some things and kind of missed it in others. And here he's saying, no, I'm praying that they would catch everything. That If God is leading them to do this, that they would do it. They would hear it and do it. For I bear him witness that he has great zeal for you. <coughs> and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. He has great zeal. He has not just zeal, but great zeal. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. We know who Luke is. He's the one that wrote the book of Acts and the book of Luke. There's another brilliant one. Who wrote the book of Luke? Luke. Rock, he is on it today. Demas 
says that Demas greets you along with Luke. Now, Demas is an interesting guy because we've been hearing about all these people who are right on with the Lord. Second Timothy, toward the end of Paul's ministry, maybe it's because of the intensity that's going on in Paul's ministry. Paul's about ready to lose his life in Second Timothy. And it says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Well, departed for Thessalonica. I'll just stop it there. Demas is forsaken. Could you imagine being in the Bible, and then the last thing that's spoken about you is that you've forsaken the Lord? You've forsaken the Lord and off to Thessalonica, which is our new, next book. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, next week, if we don't finish these next three verses. So the point is here is that Demas has forsaken Paul, and he loved this present world. Don't forsake the Lord or his servants, the church, or this present world, because this present world is passing away passing away and don't do that and then depart for some greener grass somewhere else greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church that is in his house some of your translations if you have an NIV or an ESV anything that's referencing something other than the Textus Receptus if you know what I'm talking about here it's going to say that Nymphus is Nympha <coughs> excuse me and that it's a woman. Well, no, Nymphus is a guy, but the name means nymph given, which again, that's kind of a bummer. How would you like to have a name? Maybe it's a good thing, I don't know. But how would you like to have a name? Yeah, I'm, I'm here because of a nymph. That's his name. But he's got a church in his house and that he's been faithful with it. Pretty awesome. Uh, I, I don't know what nymphs are. I had to sort of re rethink about it. But these are, the, these are like these um, like spiritual maidens that live by the rivers and by the, in the woods and so on. I mean, I kind of had a picture of it, but it's kind of occultic, actually. It is. If you're into that stuff, don't, don't go there because it, it deals with the occult. But the point is, is that that's what his name is. And he had a church there. And that's pretty awesome. Verse 16. Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it's read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So that's awesome. He's going and telling them to, you know, that there's a connection between this book and um, the church of Laodicea, which we, as we've seen from uh, Revelation 3, it's the lukewarm church, remember? And so it's it's connected here but then we find out that there's another epistle that was from that he wrote to the Laodiceans that evidently has been lost we could say oh boy we lost it well if it didn't make it we'll just assume that God intended for that to not make it into the canon of scripture so fret not but know that there was another letter it's kind of like first Corinthians is actually like second Corinthians there's a letter to the Corinthians that was written that you know is, is not not around it, it wasn't copied for us to the degree that we have a copy now so verse 17 and say to archippus take heed to the ministry which you have received in the lord that you may fulfill it now archippus he's he's really only got one mention doesn't have a lot of mentions in the bible but it's significant and i'll circle back around to it this salutation by my own hand paul remember my chains grace be with you amen so this was transcribed or or you know, Paul would would speak, dictate it, and then someone else was writing here. So there's probably Archippus who was doing this. No, I'm sorry. Uh, it was probably Epaphras who was doing this. But uh, he signed it with his own hand. Now notice, though, at the very end, in verse 17, this insignificant guy named Archippus, what's he say? Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. I think this is for us. Anybody that's feeling insignificant, anybody that's not feeling like Paul or Epaphras or anybody who's in the book of the, in the, you know, in the, in the Bible, you just think, 
Here I am. What am I supposed to do? What's my ministry? What does God have for me to do? Well, this is what he has for you and me and everybody to take heed to the ministry which you've received in the Lord and fulfill it. To take heed to the ministry you've received, fulfill it. Don't fall short. Don't forget it. Don't ignore it, but do it. As Paul says in verse 4, as I ought to speak, same thing. Take heed to the ministry you've received. Might not be Paul's, but fulfill it. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. We ask your blessing upon every life that is impacted by this message, that we would hear your word, that we would receive your word, that we would understand what our mission and ministry is, and that we would understand this ministry, this service, and fulfill it, to take heed to it and fulfill it. And we've seen a lot of examples, a lot of different names, a lot of different people doing different things. And yet, Lord, we pray that as we have received our ministries and we're seeking to fulfill them, that, Lord, we would be mindful of, of doors that could be open and manners in which we can season with salt uh, this message that you've given to us to make it palatable to the people who are around us so that they would receive Jesus Christ, that they would know that they're not cast-offs or not part of it, but that they can be part of it, that they could be saved because you love them and you made provision for them to come into this way of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so if you confess him as Lord today, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, as it says in Romans 10, 9, then you will be saved. And go with that assurance. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.